All right, so let's talk about a very familiar concept, and that's rates of change um, inside of a graph. So you all have definitely seen this concept before, and I'm just going to get a definition up real quick, and we'll, we'll talk about it. So the average rate of change is given by this formula. It's the change in output over the change in input. And if you remember, we called our outputs y's, and we called our inputs x's, meaning that this whole thing here is just equal to your change in y's. So we're going to use this symbol here called a delta. It looks like a triangle. Delta y over delta x. And all that this here um, delta means, this right here, all that this thing means is just change in. So we'll write that out real quick. It just means change in. Put it in quotes because that's what we're doing. And what you can see is that this is just another way to write this. So the change in output over the change in input. Remember our inputs are x's, our outputs are y's. And this is um, a function that I'm positive that you all have seen before. I'm going to write it in yellow just so it doesn't blend in. And it's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And you may notice this as the formula for slope. So this is given two points, y1, uh, x1, y1, and x2, y2. We're able to find the average rate of change between those two points using this. Now, you, re you may remember um, from a couple lessons ago that we talked about our f of x, our function f of x, just being that same old y that we've talked about for forever. So instead of saying um, y, which is your output again, um, we can say f of x. That is, we took the input x and we did f to it and we got y out, which enables us to write in a very nice, uh, sort of concise way, instead of writing y2 and y1, we can say, well, here, instead of saying um, y, we said we do f to the x that goes with it. So we're going to do f to the x that goes with y2. That is, we're going to do f to the x that goes with y2, which is x2, minus f of x1, over the exact same denominator, x2 minus x1. And remember, this is we're given this pair, we're given this ordered pair that looks like um, this. We're given these two ordered pairs, this guy and this guy. And our inputs, I'm going to do in blue, are x1 and x2. And our outputs I will do in um, this orange, and they are y1 and y2. So these are the two points on some graph that we are finding uh, basically the average rate of change, the distance between. So this guy here, y1 and y2, these guys have a different name. If you would rather call y1 instead f of x1, f of x1, you can, and you can call y2 f of x2. Because how do you get this output? You just do the function on the input to get the output. That's all that you're doing there. So this is the formula for average rate of change of a function. It's just the old slope formula that you're used to, and we've jazzed it up a little bit. So instead of writing y2, we write f of x2, and instead of writing uh, y1, you write f of x1, and that means that we only really have two variables to plug in, x1 and x2. And if you know x1, x2, and the function, then you can find everything, and you don't need this extra little bit. So let's look at an example real quick, just to get us sort of familiar with how to compute this, and then we'll move on. So let's say that we were asked to find the average rate of change of the function f of x equals x squared on this interval, closed interval, has to be closed for this to work, from negative 1 to 2. So let's draw the entire, uh, let's draw the picture here of, of what we're trying to find exactly. So let's draw your x and your y here, and then let's go actually sort of graph um, let's graph this function. So x squared just looks like a parabola, which we're just going to do like this. Um, and then it opens like a bowl, roughly like this. This is a rough sketch. 
and then we just need negative 1 and 2. Now these are both inputs. The interval, remember, is just the x-axis. It was just your number line. The number line is your x-axis. So I need to go find negative 1 and 2. We'll do that in orange. So I'm going to go out to about negative 1, which I'm going to say is about that distance. So there's 1, so that means that this is about 2. And this, um, this y-axis is going to be labeled here in a second, and I'll show you how to get to that, but that's negative 1, and that's 2. And what we want to do is we want to find the average rate of change on this interval. And let me show you what we're trying to do. I'm going to underline this in this sort of blue color. And I'm going to show you what we're doing. So if you go to negative 1, you get some value out, which we'll calculate here in a minute. And then if you go to 2, you hop up onto the function and you get some value out. And the main thing that we're looking for, guys, is we're trying to find basically the slope of this line right here that goes right in between these two. That is, uh, that is exactly what we're trying to find. So we're just trying to find uh, the slope of this line right here. That is, we're trying to find the rise over the run of this here. The average rate of change is the slope of the line. It's how much this function changed between this point and this point. So I need to know, in order to compute this, I have x1 and x2. Look here, that's x1, that's x2. Because these are the x's, because they're on the x-axis. So now I need to know f of x1 and f of x2. So I need to know f of x1... which is going to be x squared evaluated at x1. So this is going to be f of what was x1. x1 is negative 1. This is going to be f of negative 1, which means I'm just going to plug a negative 1 into a squared function, and I'm going to get out a 1. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing for f of x2. So this is just f of whatever x2 was. x2 was 2. And so all that that means is I'm just going to plug 2 into the squared function. And when you plug things in, plug them in in parentheses, so it takes x and it squares it. So this is 4. So then apparently up here, this is 4. And right here, this is 1. And so now we actually know the coordinates of each of these. So I'll put the coordinates in this nice color here. So this is the coordinate 2, 4. And this here is the coordinate negative 1, 1. Okay, and that is all of the values that we need. So we have f of x2, f of x1, x1, and x2. So now we can actually come over here, and I can do it up here, and we can calculate the actual average rate of change for this. So the average rate of change is going to be precisely this. It's going to be f of x2. I'll write the formula out one more time. It's going to be f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. And this is going to equal, now we just go fill everything in. f of x2, we found it down here, it was 4. So it's just going to be 4. So we're going to plug that in. So we're going to get 4, okay? Minus your f of x1 was 1, okay? And that's going to be over. And then our other two values here um, were 2 for x2, so 2 for x2 minus, and then our x1 was negative 1. So we plug in a negative 1 in parentheses, okay? And now we're just going to finish this math out really easy. So 4 minus 1 is 3 over 2 minus a negative 1 is plus a positive 1 is 3, and so 3 over 3 is 1. So the average rate of change of f of x equals x squared on 1 to 2 is 1. So we would come over here and we would say that our variable, to finish out the problem, we're going to write that m average, m sub avg, we use m because this is just a slope, equals 1. And what we've said is that the average rate of change between these two points along this function curve is 1. And that's the most basic example that I can do. And what I'm going to do with the rest of this is just go over um, more things uh, like this, but they're going to get a little bit more uh, complicated. And then we're going to talk about some extrema and some uh, increasing and decreasing functions, and we're done. So let's scroll down, and let's talk about uh, another example. But let's make this one a little bit more spicy. 
So this is a much more spicy example, but we're going to find the average rate of change, that's all that means, of, and here's your function, s of t is 1 over t plus 4, and we're going to find it on the closed interval from 9 to 9 plus h. So first off, you might be looking at this and wondering, what, what does that mean? We're assuming that h is greater than 0, I certainly hope. So here's all that this means. Let's go get, let's go get a number line here, and let's get the number 9 and put it right here. And so as long as h is greater than 0, and that's what we're assuming, we're going to go ahead and assume that h is strictly greater than 0, that if you come over here to 9 plus h, all that you've done is added h to 9, which means that this distance right here is just h. So you've scooted over some positive distance h. So you can actually, once we've found uh, the answer to this, which isn't going to be a number, it's going to be a number in terms, it's going to be a function in terms of h, you can plug in any h you want to, and that gives you any distance you feel like, and you can find the average rate of change for that. So that's useful. And we're going to do it for this really weird looking function. And I challenge you uh, to go on Desmos and take a look at this. Uh, go, go plot this function on Desmos and look at it. It's a really messed up function. It's called a rational function. And we'll talk about it way later in the year. Um, but for now, we're just going to find the average rate of change. And then I'm going to show you guys a picture on Desmos of what exactly it is that we did. So let's start by just setting this thing up. And we're going to say that the average, um, your average rate of change, MAVG, is equal to, and then we're just going to write this. Now, it's not going to be F of x2 and f of x1 because our function is um, s. So it's going to be s, all right, of t2 minus s of t1 over t2 minus t1. So if you look back at your definition, and I encourage you to look down at your paper and look at your definition, it originally had f of x2, f of x1. But now our function is s, so our, our s's are our functions instead of f's, and our inputs are t's. So instead of x's, like we had last time, we have t's. Other than that, nothing changes. So this is your formula, and so we're just going to plug everything in and do what is going to turn into some absolutely hellacious algebra. But that's all that it is, is just hellacious algebra. So let's plug everything in. So we know for a fact that the bottom is going to be t2 minus t1. So we're going to plug in everything here. So t2 was 9 plus h, so we're going to plug that in. So we know that t2 was 9 plus h, and it's going to be plugged in here. Right? It's going to be a minus from the problem, and then it's going to be minus the t1, which was 9, and then up here, we're going to have s of t2, which we know t2 to be 9 plus h. The minus is from the problem. s of, and then t1, which we know to be 9. So we're just going to write out what all of this means. This is just going to be equal to, on the bottom, we have 9 plus h minus 9. That's just h. That's easy enough. And then up here, we're going to write, well, we know that s of something is 1 over something plus 4, so it's going to be 1 over something plus 4. And then this other one is minus, it's the same form, 1 over something plus 4, so it's the same thing again, 1 over something plus 4. And then we just need to know what to put in here. Well, for this one, we're going to put in 9 plus h. And over here, we're just going to put in 9. And now the rest of this math is just going to be uh, simplifying this. So let's go. Let's notice first that this entire top is being divided by h. And we can simplify this just a little bit by writing 1 over h out in front of this. Multiplying this numerator by 1 over h is the same thing as dividing by h. So that's going to save us some space. So we're just going to go ahead and do that. And if you don't believe me, pause it. And once I've written this out, pause it and distribute this and see if you can't get it back to this. And then on the bottom, 9 plus h plus 4 is 13 plus h. 9 plus 4 is 13. So it's going to be 13 plus h here minus 
1 over, and then 9 plus 4 is 13. Okay, so in order to subtract these two from one another, you need to have like exponents. The only way that we're going to get like exponents is by multiplying uh, the two together, 13 times 13 plus h. So the thing that I'm missing over here is a 13 plus h. So I'm going to multiply the bottom by 13 plus h. And I'm going to multiply the top by 13 plus h. So now I have 13 times 13 plus h. Here, over here, I already have the 13 plus h. And all that I need is the h, or the 13 rather. I'm missing the 13. So I'm going to multiply by 13 on the bottom and also 13 on the top. And now we're just going to do all of this math. I've multiplied by 1 here. I've multiplied by 1 here. I haven't changed anything. So let's do all the math, getting a common denominator. So this is going to be 1 over h times 13 over and I don't want to multiply these together yet. I'm just going to write the 13 first. 13 times 13 plus h minus, and then it, on the top here, 1 times 13 plus h is 13 plus h, in parentheses still. And on the bottom, we have 13 times 13 plus h. Okay. So this should be looking like some rather hellacious math. We're just going to scroll down here. And we're just going to keep working on this. So now we have the same denominator, 13 times 13 plus h. So we can go ahead and put the top together. So we're going to write this as 1 over h times, and then the common denominator was 13 times 13 plus h. So let's write that down, 13 times 13 plus h. And yeah, we could go ahead and distribute this if you wanted to and get uh, 13h plus 169 or 169 plus 13h, whichever order you want to. We'll do that in a minute. We don't need to yet. But on top, you have 13 minus, and then in parentheses, 13 plus h. And this is why plugging in things in parentheses is so important because we're going to have to distribute this to get to the next step. So we're going to get 1 over h times, this will be 13 minus 13 minus h, because we have to distribute the negative to both of them, over 13 times 13 plus h. And what we're going to get now is 13 minus 13 cancels. We're left with a minus h here. So let's go ahead and figure that out. So this is 1 over h times 13 minus 13 is 0. We just got a minus h on the top over, and I'm going to go ahead and multiply this in now. So let's go ahead and do that. So it's 169 plus 13h, all right? And now the last step is, you notice that there is a h on the top over here and an h on the bottom over here. They cancel. So all we're going to do now is just cancel these two things, this h with this h. This one's on the top, this one's on the bottom. If you don't believe me, Multiply this 1 over h in. 1 times negative h is negative h, and then the h is just going to be multiplied by both of these, um, and you can uh, cancel everything out. 1 times this is 1 times this, h times, and then in parentheses, if you want to think about it, you'd have an h here and a 1 here times this, right? So the 1 times that just gives you the negative h, and then those h's will cancel. That's all the math that you're doing, which is what we're saying when we say that this and this cancel with one another, giving you that... Uh, well, it's just one on the outside, so we don't have to write it anymore. These parentheses are no longer doing anything. There's a negative one left on the top over, and then I'm going to rewrite these in a different order. 13h plus 169. And then I'm aware of there's no way to get this any more simplified. So this is your answer. So this is the average rate of change, the average rate of change, of s of t equals 1 over t plus 4 on this interval. So you give me some positive distance h, and all you've got to do is go plug it into this, and it'll give you the average rate of change between the two. So if you imagine I gave you a large batch of problems where you were always finding it between 9 and some number greater than 9, all you would have to do is figure out what the h was and plug it into this 30 times instead of doing 30 of these problems. That's just being pragmatic. This is just some hellacious algebra is all that it is. But you need to be able to do stuff like this because this is just using this formula. So if you can use this formula, you're good to go. Lucky for you, there's plenty of practice on Khan Academy and Delta Math for you.
So, so your book here does a fantastic job at going through this, so I thought I would just look at this. So look here. We have the function f of x equals x cubed minus 12x, and we have the intervals in which it's e increasing and the intervals in which it's decreasing. So read it from left to right like a book, and you can see that the function is clearly increasing from negative infinity all the way over here, it's just way down lower, all the way up to negative 2. Then it's also increasing from positive 2 on to infinity. You can see that it's decreasing between negative 2 and positive 2. So here's how, you, here's how you write that. The function, we can say the function f of x equals x cubed minus 12x is increasing on negative infinity to 2 union 2 to infinity. So that is on those two intervals pasted together from negative infinity to 2, so from negative infinity up here to 2. And then from 2 on to infinity, it's increasing. And then it's decreasing between these two points, between, um, between negative 2 and 2. So between negative 2 and 2, it is decreasing. And so this is how you would tell me that. So all that we're saying is that we are increasing from negative infinity to this point, 2, negative 2, and then from 2 onward to infinity we're increasing, so you paste them together using this language right here, and then they are decreasing from negative 2 to 2, De decreasing as in the y values are getting smaller, more negative, increasing as in the y values or the outputs or the range or the f of whatever the function is, is getting bigger, that's what increasing means, that's all that we're talking about. So. The next thing that we want to talk about is local maximums, local minimums, and local extrema in general. So if you look in this area, this has a local maximum at negative 2. The local maximum at negative 2 is 16. That is, in this area, in this area, the biggest that it gets, the biggest that it gets is 16 in this area. The local minimum, you can see, occurs at x equals 2. So the minimums occur at x values. The local minimum is negative 16. It occurs at 2. It is negative 16. That's the local minimum. The local maximum occurs at negative 2, x equals negative 2, and is positive 16. That's the local maximum. There's a difference between a local maximum and a global maximum. The global maximum for this function is the largest value it ever attains, not just the largest value it, it attains um, between these points here. So this is a local maximum uh, specifically because it, within this open interval, within say some open interval from, let's say, um, negative uh, four to um, four, the biggest that it gets is 16, and the smallest that it gets is negative 16. That's inside of some interval. So you, you chop off some part of this, and we say, well, only from here to here, what's the biggest it gets, what's the smallest it gets? If you want to talk about a global, though, like the whole thing, the absolute maximum, the absolute minimum, uh, you can pause the video for a second and think about it. And you should come to the realization that the largest this function ever gets, not just in this little window that we're looking at, but on the whole thing is positive infinities, the biggest it ever gets, and negative infinities, the smallest it ever gets. So that is the idea of maximums and minimums, and collectively maximums and minimums are known as extrema. So right here, it's known as extrema. So. We are asked in your book to find the absolute maxima and minima from a graph. And you can see that the graph actually begins at this point and ends at this point. There is no arrow. This is all of the graph that there is. And we're asked to find the absolute maxima and minima. The maxima are the biggest value, and you need to tell me the value that they are, that is the height, and you also need to tell me the x you had to go over, which is where it occurs. So the absolute maxima are going to occur, we can see pretty clearly, at two points. The absolute maxima is 16, because right here and right here are both 16, so that is the absolute maxima. This absolute maxima occurs at x equals negative 2. This absolute maxima at 16 occurs at x equals positive 2. 
The absolute minima is the smallest that it gets on the window. The smallest that it gets is not zero, because look over here, it seems to go down to negative 10. So we'll say that the absolute minima is negative 10, and it occurs at x equals 3. So if we scroll down, you can click on the show solution here, and it'll tell you everything that I just told you. Your book is a fantastic resource for any more examples that you could possibly want. I highly encourage you to use it. That being said, there are plenty of Khan Academy and Delta Math assignments and videos on all of this to get you even more familiarized, and that will be the end of this overview.